Thank you everyone for joining and, and good morning. I'm honored that you've chosen our session to, to begin your Water Week journey with. My name is Allison Bartell and I serve as a senior advisor in the US Department of State in the Office of the Undersecretary for Civilian Security, Democracy and Human Rights. Um, thank you again for joining our, our panel discussion on Glacier Guardians protecting Himalayan source waters for regional peace building. This session will explore strategies to mitigate development's adverse effects while ensuring fair water distribution and enhancing ecosystem resilience with a focus on glaciers. Uh, before the panel, a few opening speakers will, will give you a broader contextual overview. Um, we have one Undersecretary Azra Zaya, um, and then we have a speaker from the Government of India, as well as our own uh, Dr. Rebecca Peters, who will, who will provide opening remarks. Um, Azra Zaya is Undersecretary for Civilian Security, Democracy, and Human Rights, and she leads global diplomatic efforts in civilian security, democracy promotion, and raising awareness of, of human rights globally. Um, so I'll turn to a pre recorded video statement from Undersecretary Zaya now. Thank you. Good morning and welcome. My name is Azra Zaya, and I'm the Undersecretary for Civilian Security, Democracy, and Human Rights at the U.S. Department of State. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to all joining this session today, both in Stockholm and virtually from around the globe. Stretching across the southern border of the Tibetan Plateau, the Himalayan mountain region includes over 100,000 square kilometers of glaciers one of the largest stores of frozen water in the world. These reserves are crucial sources of fresh water, not only for those in the region, but also for over 1.8 billion people downstream. The Himalayan region and Tibetan Plateau and their fragile ecosystems are vulnerable to climate change. As increased temperatures imperil this frozen cache of fresh water high in the mountains, we are reminded of the imperative to accelerate reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, keeping us below that 1.5 degrees Celsius benchmark to help preserve these majestic glaciers. And we recognize that regional climate conversations cannot be divorced from governance issues. Opaque governance institutions and infrastructure development without inclusive public input exacerbate the impact of warming temperatures. In recent years, the People's Republic of China, or PRC, has dramatically increased large-scale water diversion projects and hydropower development across the Tibetan Plateau. Infrastructure on the plateau also impacts water resources of the Brahmaputra, Indus, and Mekong. These policies have been designed and implemented without input from the six million Tibetans in China and are contributing to displacement of Tibetan communities. Scientists also struggle to obtain and verify data from Tibetan areas of China, which has vast implications for research and policy development. Without transparent information on areas like snowpack melt, regional partners are hindered from preventing, preparing for, and adapting to our changing climate. Working together on shared resources is challenging, but critical for shared prosperity. We've learned that transparency and trust are a vital part of maintaining these partnerships. The United States and Canada, for example, share the longest political border in the world. It spans the Great Lakes and dozens of shared rivers, including the Columbia River, the namesake of a treaty that has governed our nation's water security cooperation for over 60 years. We are in the process of modernizing the treaty where we seek to set the stage for how our two countries will work together in the future to adapt to the effects of climate change, protect vulnerable communities, and elevate U.S. tribes and Canadian Indigenous nations' voices. Despite the challenges, now is the time 
to develop innovative and inclusive solutions. The United Nations General Assembly declared 2025 the Year of International Glaciers Preservation. On the brink of 2025 and responding to this call to action, we look forward to hearing from our expert moderator and panelists and our NGO organizing partner, the International Water Management Institute, who will share perspectives on advancing regional collaboration and meaningful inclusion to address water security challenges through the lens of glaciers. The United States is committed to advancing our partnership with the stakeholders from across the world with us today as we work together to tackle climate change and advance a more water secure world for all. Thank you again for joining this important conversation. So next, I'm honored to introduce Dr. Rebecca Peters, who serves as the Senior International Water Policy Advisor in the U.S. Department of State's Bureau of Oceans and International Environmental and Scientific Affairs. In this role, she bridges the diplomatic, development, defense, and scientific communities to advance global water management, governance, and security. Um, Dr. Rebecca Peters. Thank you. Is, is it working? Okay, great. Thank you, Allison, and thank you, Under Secretary Zaya, for those insightful remarks. My name is Rebecca Peters, and I'm serving as the Senior International Water Policy Advisor in our Office of Conservation and Water. It's really my pleasure to welcome those of you joining us here and tuning in from afar. While the glaciers and rivers of the Hindu Kush Himalaya may seem far away from our vantage point here in Stockholm, changes there have far-reaching consequences for food, energy, and water security. As we heard from Undersecretary Zaya, more than a billion people depend on the Indus, Ganges, and Brahmaputra river systems, which are fed by snow and glacial melt from the Hindu Kush Himalayan region. Perhaps the most profound impact of climate change will be experienced through water, either too much or too little, as declining snowpack, rising temperatures, and variable precipitation exacerbate droughts, floods, and other hydrological extremes. These changes already threaten food, water, and energy, which undermines the ability of local and national governments to protect people from water and climate-related disasters, and to provide sustainable access to safe drinking water and sanitation. About 40% of the world's agricultural irrigation is supported by water flows from glacial and snow melt. Receding glaciers and reduced snowfall means less natural water storage for spring months when crops need the water. Cumulatively, natural disasters were estimated to have cost $92 billion globally in 2019. And just last week, we saw the devastating consequences of a glacier lake outburst flood in Nepal. The impacts of climate change and growing water demand increase the pressures on major transboundary rivers that provide the basis of livelihoods for billions of people and as a critical economic input. Responding to climate change requires adaptive institutions and infrastructure built to accommodate and operate effectively under a range of conditions. The United States recognizes the transformational power of water security for communities and economies. As the United States addresses these issues at home, we also seek to support a water secure world to meet not only today's demands, but the demands of a future that is increasingly hard to predict. That's why President Biden's Emergency Action Plan for Adaptation and Resilience, or PREPARE, a whole of government effort to empower more than half a billion people in developing countries to adapt to and manage the impacts of climate change, includes support for the development, delivery, and use of climate information for water resources management, and the rapid increase of water storage capacity. Working toward a water secure world for all requires support and coordination from all of us. That's why the United States is pleased to have joined the Global Freshwater Challenge and furthermore announced a bold national goal to protect, restore, and reconnect 8 million acres of wetlands and 100,000 miles of our nation's rivers and streams by 2030 under the America the Beautiful Freshwater Challenge. We'll need to work together to raise diplomatic awareness, increase access to reliable data, 
provide development and technical assistance, and help with financing and good governance. In the Hindu Kush Himalaya region, the United States supports a collaborative approach to improve water security and resilience. The Tibetan Policy and Support Act of 2020 promotes increased transparency and information sharing between the People's Republic of China, Himalayan, and other downstream nations, as well as the Tibetan community. Programs like NASA and USAID's Severe Hindu Kush Himalaya, implemented by the International Center for Integrated Mountain Development, ECMOD, here with us today, and Mod Snow, a USAID program to monitor glaciers and provide short-term forecasting, each constructively link community perspectives with cutting edge technological and scientific advancements to improve early warning systems for environment and climate change related disasters. As programs like Severe and Mod Snow demonstrate, developments in satellite earth observation capabilities can significantly improve data availability in low resource settings. Satellite remote sensing has become a fundamental scientific method to study the global environment, cryosphere, hydrology, and land use change, and is now arguably the predominant approach for gathering observations, especially at landscape and planetary scales. Yet, these advancements are best positioned to complement and not replace the role of indigenous knowledge and practices. Indeed, our discussion today will offer new perspectives and recommendations to identify ways to make the most of the application of science, technology, and local and indigenous knowledge and practices to advance glacier and freshwater system protection and conservation. As our panelists show with their range of background from anthropology to climate science to glaciology, diverse skill sets are essential to contribute to improving early warning systems, reducing the impacts of disasters, and ultimately preserving glaciers, snowpack, and freshwater systems. As we engage uh, our esteemed panelists today, Dr. Pasang Yangji Sherpa, Ms. Shuchi Vora, Dr. Austin Lord, and Dr. Arun Bhakta Shretha, let's channel the insights we gather today into actionable policy ideas and collaborative efforts. Thank you again to Undersecretary Zaya and our NGO partner, the International Water Management Institute. We're also grateful for the participation of the government of India's Ministry of Jal Shakti. I'm now pleased to introduce Chairman Kushvinder Vora of the Central Water Commission and ex officio secretary to the government of India. He serves as the president of the Indian Water Resources Society, vice president of the International Commission for Irrigation and Drainage, uh, senior vice president for the Central Board of Irrigation and Power, and chairman of the National Committee on Dam Safety. Chairman Vora, thank you. Respected dignitaries present, greetings from India. The Himalayan region is known as the freshwater tower of the South Asia and considered to be the largest storehouse of snow and glaciers outside the polar region, thereby also known as the third pole. The Indian Himalayan region spans over 5.37 lakh square kilometer and covers nearly 16.2% of total geographical area of the country. This region regulates the climate of South Asian region the water resources regime of Indian Himalayas is diverse and ranges from glaciers and snow to wetlands, river systems, groundwater and springs. Himalaya has a specific fragile landscape, steep orography and high relief terrain which makes Himalayas extremely susceptible to cloudburst hazards such as debris flow, flash floods and landslides. The Himalayas are drained by 19 major rivers with Indus, Ganges and Brahmaputra among the largest. Importance of the river systems originating from the Himalayas can be understood from the fact that every year around 1200 billion cubic meter of water which is around 60% of the annual runoff from all rivers of India flows through these river systems which sustains the lives of more than 500 million people in the downstream. Nearly 17% area of the Indian Himalayas is under permanent snow cover and glaciers. As per the GSI inventory, there are 9,575 glaciers in the Indian Himalayas. Springs are very important primary source of water for urban and rural water supply in Indian Himalayas. It is reported that out of 5 million springs of India, nearly 3 million springs are in Himalayan region alone and 50 million people of 12 states of Indian Himalayas depend on these springs. Problems related to drying of springs is observed in the recent times. In Indian Himalayan region, groundwater remains the most undiscovered subject 
with overall stage of development as 30 percent however there is significant variation in groundwater development in general mass balance observations over different regions of the indian himalayas show somewhat negative mass balance years on the whole studies suggest that western central and eastern himalayas are experiencing thinning of glaciers on the other hand karakoram region has shown slight mass gain during almost similar periods however the glaciology hydrological and geodetic mass balance data appear to exhibit short term series bias and long term continuous measurements are desirable climate change has emerged as biggest threat in 40 years due to climate change himalayan region is experiencing rise in temperature and precipitation patterns water security in himalayan region is a complex and multifaceted issue that requires a coordinated approach involving government schemes local communities and scientific research the government of india has launched several initiatives aimed at addressing the unique challenges faced by the region some of which include pradhan mantri krishi sinchai yojana which is designed to improve irrigation efficiency and expand the area under assured irrigation in the himalayan region this schemes aims to harness the traditional water resources like springs and streams promote water conservation improve water use efficiency in agriculture by integrating watershed development and promoting micro irrigation the scheme contributes to water security for agriculture purposes in the region the jal jeevan mission aims to provide safe and adequate drinking water to every rural household the mission is implemented in partnership with state governments and focuses on decentralized community managed water supply systems JGM encourages the use of local water sources and promotes the adoption of traditional water management practices main focus is on source sustainability namami ganga program although focuses on ganges river it has implications for water security in the himalayan region the program aims to clean and rejuvenate the ganges by reducing pollution promoting sustainable agriculture and restoring ecological balance the key components of the program include the treatment of sewage and industrial effluents the restoration of wetlands and flood plains and the promotion of organic farming practices the program also involves the active participation of local communities in river conservation efforts national mission for sustaining the himalayan ecosystem focuses on understanding the complex interactions between the himalayan ecosystem and climate change the mission aims to ensure sustainable development while addressing the impacts of climate change on water sources in the himalayas there is a need for continuous monitoring adaptation and collaboration of various departments to ensure that these efforts lead to sustainable water security for the regions inhabitants and ecosystem by integrating traditional knowledge with modern technology and policy intervention we can safeguard the water sources of the himalaya for future generations i thank you for your kind attention thank you to shri kushvinder vora for those remarks um next we'll get on to our, our panel, our main segment of the session. Um, first, I'd like to invite up our esteemed moderator, Dr. Alok Sika, who serves as the representative for India and Bangladesh at the International Water Management Institute. Alok will provide a brief scene setter, and then we'll invite up our panelists. Thank you. Very good morning to all. And uh, first of all, let me also Welcome all of you on my behalf, on behalf of International Water Management Institute. And I also thank uh, U.S. Department of State for having EMI as a joint partner in this and a very important and dear work. Now, Good to see you. can you go on to the next slide, please? So I'll just take maybe three minutes to set the scene. Already the speakers have set the scene or the context. And uh, because we know that these Himalayas are called the water towers because they are home to about one-fifth of the world's fresh water supply and they support over 1.8 billion population. 
But of late, the accelerated melting of the glaciers, retreating glaciers, land degradation, and ad hoc development of the large water diversion projects, hydropower projects, so some of those kind of things, and the land degradation has been having some kind of a water security challenges in the region. And uh, so those implications are already there on the fresh waters. And then it's not only that, but also it's posing a threat to the ecological balance and the ecosystem in that particular area and the economic well-being. And so it's in that perspective that this particular session has been organized to try and see that how best we can put our minds and souls together to see how we can protect and preserve this Himalayas. So next. And in the next slide, I'll just take you through the glimpse of the entire Himalayas, that how they look like. They are, as I said, they are spread vast in South and Southeast Asia. And when you go from South to North, the Himalayas are classified like from the lower Himalayas, outer Himalayas, and the, also called the lesser Himalayas, and then the greater Himalayas or the higher Himalayas, which have got all the high snow peaks and the glaciers and the snow fields, and then the trans Himalayas. The other way, some people have been also classifying this thing. When you go from west to east, as western, central, and the eastern Himalayas. So all of them, they have a different features in terms of the topography, geography, land use, and various other agriculture and the other practices. Next, please. And in the next slides, I just wanted to show, share some of these key challenges which others have already spoken. So I'm not going to take much time because we are already running late too. But one of the key points has been that now as a result of the climate change, these things are getting accentuated. So that's something kind of a worry, something. And also the depletion of natural springs. Because this is something in the springs are the lifeline in that area. And the depletion of the springs are also kind of a causing a major concern. The other thing is upstream downstream linkages. Because upstream downstream linkages, as I said, that whenever we are doing some things in the upstream areas have a, may have a downstream repercussions. So at the same time, we always talk about the conflicts, but perhaps maybe there are complementarities as well. So that's try and look into those things and how uh, we can try to see that the socioeconomic impacts on those especially who are marginalized and the women are kind of minimized or they are none. Now, with this, I move on to the, my last slide to show what are the, our objectives. Our objectives here are clearly to discuss and look at some kind of a policy frameworks and technology-driven approaches to address water security challenges in the region, and then also to talk about some innovative glacier protection and preservation methods, and uh, also to look into how best we can have a climate projections and the enhanced data sharing to improve our understanding in this entire domain of under, uh, knowledge, particularly looking into the upstream downstream linkages and early warning systems, and the climate-induced risk and how they can be reduced. And finally, we really cannot manage anything if we are not addressing the inclusivity. So inclusiveness, the gender and the social equity. So that's kind of a thing. So with this session objectives, now I invite the panelists. Next, please. Uh, and as they have been already introduced, so Rebecca, thank you very much for having introduced so that reduces my one minute, but still maybe <laughs> till the time they are kind of coming to the podium, maybe they can try to really look into that. Is your and Basa. Uh, and Arun. Austin. Suchi. So Suchi is with the uh, Global Reliance Partnership based in Bangalore. And uh, she is the Resilience Evidence Coalition. Arun is uh, with International Center of EC Mode, and she is she is the strategic group lead for the Center and uh, Environmental Research and Environmental Risk. Austin is a senior fellow with the Simpson Center and the University of Toronto, Canada, and Pachang is assistant professor uh, life based in indigenous areas 
and she is with the University of British Columbia. So I think with this uh, brief introduction, because I'm not going to get into more in detail, so we have this esteemed galaxy of uh, analysts <laughs> here with us. <laughs> At least for the moment, you can think so. <laughs> Guardians. Okay. Guardians. So, now, I'll have a very quick first round. In the So we'll have three rounds, quick ones. The first round is very quick. Just one minute rapid fire. All of you to share your thoughts on this particular topic of protecting Himalayan source waters for regional peace building. So maybe I'll start in this direction. So with you. Okay. Um, touch delay. Um, so I'll make it quick, <laughs> one minute. Um, so water security and peace building is often imagined at the regional scale from an international perspective involving actors at the national st uh, state level. As a Sherpa scholar from FARA, commonly known as the uh, Mount Everest region, and someone who has been studying uh, Himalayan source waters for nearly two decades, uh, I've come to this conclusion that both peace building and water security have to be community led. Uh, involve intentional efforts on the ground to care for the humans and more than human relations. And so the glaciers that we are so concerned about is actually also one of those uh, relations. And so it is very important that we recognize indigenous communities as leaders in this effort and research and institutions, um, I think, uh, should see ourselves as partners and supporters to empower the community with what they need instead of the status quo where the community is treated as victims and a passive recipient of science and resources. Thank you. So, Arun? Yeah, um, very thankful to be invited here um, uh, on, uh, to talk about this important topic about depleting cryosphere resources and also its preservation. Uh, but I take it also as a symbolic uh, kind of indication that we need to preserve uh, this very important resource, uh, but also the implication it has in terms of water and its impact uh, on uh, the community, which transcends not only one administrative uh, area, but also downstream and middle stream. So it requires uh, consorted efforts, collaborative efforts across boundaries, uh, and also we know that a lot of socio-economic transformations are happening in Hindu Kush Himalaya region with a lot of infrastructure development which are at risk. So I would also like to discuss about uh, some of the implications and how those infrastructure investments can be uh, made uh, climate resilient. So I look forward to a, a engaging discussion, learning as well as sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Austin, over to you. Hello everyone, namaste. Um, so I'd just like to say briefly, chronic disasters, increasing climatic volatility and corresponding, the corresponding destabilization of the cryosphere all create environmental security concerns. And combined, they make the Himalayan region a critical site for early warnings for all, particularly if we take issues of climate justice seriously, which I know we'll talk about today. My role today is to talk mostly about coordination of data and information sharing programs, and I feel that these can help understand glacial change and monitor cri monitoring cryospheric risks. They all can support environmental security. This is particularly important when trying to identify and understand emergent risks, cascading hazards, and other types of climate-related disasters that may, perhaps we haven't seen before, risk regimes that are changing, uh, and when trying to navigate uncertainty and prepare for the unknowns that climate change is bringing to the Himalayan region. To create more effective early warning systems, for example, which I'll talk about more later, we need to collect a variety of different kinds of data, not just on hazards, but exposure and vulnerability using different methods. Um, we need to build systems for information sharing and risk communication that can be effective and timely at multiple scales. And we need to understand the ways that people themselves conceptualize and navigate uncertainty on the ground. Uh, this helps us learn faster in place. Um, so early warnings for all is full stop and investment in peace and stability. Uh, as I've argued, and pieces in Dialogue Earth and other places, and as UNDRR itself recognizes, this has to include, me, include meaningful engagement of local people living with enhanced and increased cryosphere risks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Austin. And Suchi, over to you. Thank you. 
Hi, everyone. I'm Shuchi. I work with the Global Resilience Partnership, and I'm the Resilience Evidence Coalition Lead, which essentially means I run learning communities of practice and partnerships in uh, the organization, which is itself a partnership. So why I'm here, uh, I'm a freshwater practitioner, uh, and water is definitely the face of climate change. We've been talking about mitigation long enough, uh, but resilience and adaptation uh, are the current need of the hour as we live in a climate-changed world. And a lot of what my previous speakers uh, spoke about does not happen by magic. A lot of it needs uh, honest brokering, uh, convening platforms across knowledge, uh, innovation, and policy. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, all of these aspects, bringing in transdisciplinary approaches to learning, um, challenge-led approaches to uh, action on the ground, and increasing formal and informal collaborations uh, in policy. Thank you. Thank you very much for the first round, uh, for being very much on time, on the dot. So thank you. So I hope to keep the same spirit going. So the next one, I have, I think next round we'll have one question for each, four minutes. So you have plenty of time now, four minutes. So, so I'll start with Pasang yourself. And as you know that uh, the Himalayas are melting at a faster rate than perhaps it was expected or forecast by the scientists, and which is posing the water security challenges to the communities particularly living on the frontiers. Mm -hmm. So based on your rich experience of working in that Himalayas with the communities, so can you share or provide your community perspective on this particular issue and how this community perspective is and how they are living with the accelerated rate of glacier melting? Mm -hmm. So how can they cope with that? Yeah, um, thank you so much for that question. Um, I think this is a really good time to talk about uh, the Tame flooding that just happened uh, last week, a week ago. And um, I wanted to bring that up because that's what living with climate change and living with accelerated um, um, rate of melting of glaciers, that's what it looks like. And so um, our understanding of how the glaciers are and how the community is impacted has been informed a lot of, by the research that even Dr. Srashta has done, um, pioneered. And so when I'm thinking about this question, I immediately think about the disaster risk reduction, right? And so um, that is because that is what's on the forefront for us right now. Uh, but what I also wanted to show and also uh, share today is that actually community perspectives need to be considered as a wave. Uh, and depending on the situation, the community has different perspectives, right? So at the time of the GLOF, um, at this time, uh, GLOF disaster is definitely on the forefront of what the community as a whole is thinking. And the villagers of Thami in particular, for example, is now thinking of their collective well-being, which means um, trying to make sure they have enough resources to rebuild their homes. Uh, some families lost their entire house and entire source of uh, income. Um, and so that's what villagers in Thami are concerned about. Whereas villagers in uh, downstream villagers uh, in Tok Tok and Banker, they're thinking about how they're going to not just rebuild, but first of all, where the support is going to come from, because they're not as uh, well known around the world. Uh, so Thami is the village where Tenzing Norgay and a lot of uh, world record holders, um, as, as ever summiters come from. So it's quite popular, but Tok Tok and Banker are not on the radar. And so um, that's something a lot of villagers are thinking about downstream. Uh, villagers in other places are thinking about if the uh, tourist will come, if the tourism industry will be affected by this, and which means there is a direct threat to the source of income of the local community there. Um, but finally, uh, what I wanted to uh, do is uh, leave you with two things to uh, consider. First is uh, that GLOF is one of the many risks and stressors the community face today. It's not the only one. So we cannot be, uh, it's, it's rightfully in our mind today, but I think that's only one of the many stressors and many risks. Secondly, um, the issue of uh, GLOF and disaster risk is going to only increase in uh, frequency and the rate at which GLOF happens and the impact uh, on the community. 
uh, has to be reconsidered. So in the 20th century, for example, a 100-year period, there were several gloves and kumbu, but most of it were small scale and with less of less disruption. But uh, And Dick's show of 1985 is one of those um, that has been well documented by researchers. Um, so lastly, as I stop, um, I want to point out the fact that uh, what comes up again and again when community talk uh, community talks about uh, GLOFs or any kind of disasters in the Kumbu region is the fact that not a single person died. And this is, if you look at all of the GLOF disasters uh, of the most recent years or even like the whole century, a community do point that out. And I think that's important to pay attention to. And this speaks to the way the community maintains the spiritual sanctity of the region and the sacredness of the region. And so I'm not sharing this to somehow depict this community as superstitious, uh, which is how the information tends to get erroneously interpreted. But really what I'm trying to point out is that faith and spirituality of the community is extremely important part of how we think about the risk and how we prepare for any future disasters. All right, thank you, <coughs> Pasang. And now moving on with the same thing which you've said about the glove and the glacier melt. And uh, so, Austin, uh, we know following out the fact that with the climate change, looming climate change, all these water-related risks are on the increase. So with your vast experience, can you share with us, uh, based on your experience, early warning systems for climate-induced risks and the cascading disasters? Because you know, it's leading a lot of cascading disasters to better inform the anticipatory action in such a kind of a situation. Sure. So, over to you. Sure, to you. Four minutes. Um, so I'll just start by picking up a, a bit where Pa Sang left off and re reinforcing what she said. So my experience in this space began with my own uh, personal first-hand experience of the 2015 Langtang disaster, which is a massive ice avalanche, glacier avalanche triggered by the 2015 Gorkha earthquake. It's an event I was very fortunate to survive, and in the aftermath of that, I spent eight years doing disaster recovery, response, uh, long-term planning, work with the community, doing my PhD research, but also hanging around in the valley and, and talking to scientists from ISI mode and other climate scientists from around the world, studying glaciological uh, change and also studying, starting to study uh, different cryosphere risks and hazards. And I spent a lot of time talking to yak herders as well, and I realized that there's, as Pa Sang said, there's a real critical importance to engage local communities and have real uh, dialogue across difference, which is challenging and takes a long time. I think we're seeing it in Langtang now, it's a great example, and hopefully in the wake of the Tame disaster, there'll be this type of work uh, will proceed as well. Um, but the real, one of the connections is also that in, with both the Langtang disaster and the Tame disaster, it happened in places we weren't looking, right? In Langtang, there was glaciers being studied by dozen teams from across the world, scientific research teams, but the glacier above the village that ended up having been incorporated <coughs> into the avalanche was not uh, on people's radar in the same way. And the, the lake that burst uh, Tomutse above Tame, also which I've been analyzing for the last week in my role at the Stimson Center, which I'll talk about briefly in this four minutes, uh, was also not one that was actively monitored in the same way that some other places in the Kumbu and just over the ridge line at Solropa was being monitored. So I'd like to come to this point that monitoring uh, using mul monitoring for multiple different types of hazards, we know what some of these hazards are, but we don't know what all of them are. And we really don't know how these hazards interact under new climate change conditions. That's the type of work I've been doing uh, for the last two years with the Stimson Center with our early warning systems program for cascading hazards. Uh, we're working, our approach brings together multi-hazard risk assessment, remote sensing techniques using SAR, other types of satellite imagery, um, together with on the ground localized data collection, citizen science, and then the best of hydromet forecasting that's at the current state of, uh, of the art in Nepal, which is a challenging place. Um, the core activities of our work include building a web-based toolkit, uh, to developing methodologies for understanding cascading risks and interactions, um, supporting localized data collection through partners, uh, analyzing disasters and high-risk events, including the Tame uh, disaster that happened last week. And we work with partners in the government of Nepal and NGOs to get information products to people to respond in near real time. Um, so we were very busy last week as well. We we're happy to report that some of our analysis informed the Department of Hydrology and Meteorology uh, and their report that they've just released. But these are really difficult things to track. They're hard to identify, they're hard to follow. Using um, remote sensing technologies can help, but you really have to be engaged with local, uh, local governance units, uh, community disaster management committees, for example, in places where they've been established, 
or even herders who might report signs of a glop as they did in 1985 with Digso, uh, the risks before anyone with, a, with a satellite imagery potentially uh, can access it. But the, the critical point, and I'll come back to this in the second round of comments, is that you know, the type of knowledge that local people have also is, 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 is not just uh, antiquated and timeless. The best knowledge occurs when scientific data and scientific expert type analysis from outside is combined with on the ground expert analysis of the changing conditions. So I'll come back to that. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Austin. And, uh, being <coughs> and now I move on to Arun. Arun, you were talking about the resilient infrastructure, which is really very important. And so, how can say that we can ensure that the infrastructure in transboundary basins, of course, is sustainable and resilient, considering the fact that the reciprocal risk between infrastructure development and the environmental factors are also there. And, of course, on top of that, the climate change is further <coughs> aggravating it. Mm. So what are your take <coughs> and thoughts, because you have been working with ECMOD on this area, on the resilient infrastructure. So over to you. Right. Oh, Thank you. Um, so we have heard from Dr. Pasang as well as uh, Dr. Austin, and what I'm going to say is very much related to what they have said. Um, this recent glow in Thame, uh, many, many damages, but one important part of damage was to the Thame hydropower. The intake site was washed away, so the region is out of power. Uh, <coughs> we heard about Dicho 1985. Again, Thame, which was Thame hydropower, which was ready to be commissioned, was completely damaged. Last year, October, uh, South Lonak, 1,200 <coughs> megawatt uh, hydropower was damaged. Uh, Chamoli, multiple damages. And I would like to add one. 2016, uh, there was a very small glacial lake outburst flood from Tibet, very tiny lake, like similar to what happened this year in Thame. Uh, Otikoshi hydropower intake site was completely <coughs> damaged. That was transboundary, right? These all indicates that the investments are at risk. Now, we like it or not, hydropower are being built quite massively in those river corridors. Can we do, continue to do that the way we are doing? I don't think so. So looking forward, I think we really need to think of a different approach to infrastructure as a whole and hydropower development, which, as you have said, takes into consideration development, ecosystem, and society as a nexus. I think that is, that is uh, something which we cannot uh, you know, avoid. So the first thing probably is to look at it from a river basin angle, a transboundary river basin angle, put in ecosystem, people, and development together and plan, plan it pro properly, right? Uh, looking at the stresses, climatic stresses and other environmental stresses. Um, the second thing is to embrace, uh, you know, the adaptive management. Mm -hmm. Now. Um, for your information, EC mode is working on a climate resilient hydropower guideline with government of Nepal, and we hope to get it implemented in Nepal and then scale it out uh, to other countries. Uh, but we know that there are a lot of uncertainty in climate change, so we have to be ready. Although we manage certain known risks, we have to be ready for unknown risk. So flexibility in infrastructure is very important. For example, the changes in uh, um, flows or the extremes in flows and so on and so forth. And, and also to incorporate nature-based solutions in, 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 the, in the watershed system like uh, wetland management, floodplain management, et cetera, so that the extremes both dry and wet extremes can, can be managed. Uh, third, I think uh, Dr. Austin talked about data uh, and early warning system. Data sharing is very, very important. And we all know how challenging it is in our reason for cross-border data, data sharing, but it is very important and we have to start somewhere. And we are all working on it and ACMOD is also working on uh, different initiative the minister level, level mechanism for that and basin level mechanism for that. So it takes time and uh, it, it, it is something we cannot, uh, you know, uh, think of doing it overnight. It needs passion, it needs patience and all that, right? And lastly, coming back to you, Dr. Pasang, community involvement is very important. It might be challenging in a transboundary river basin scale. A lot of those mechanisms talk about 
top level dialogues, top level negotiation, and overlook communities. But then if we continue to do that, I think that will not, not be sustainable. So that's the, that's the fourth element I would suggest in, in this uh, regards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arun. <coughs> and uh, now I move on to <coughs> Suchi. Suchi, you have been working on uh, resilience and adaptation. <coughs> now, listening to all these, so I'm now going to repeat those challenges which are already there. So what do you think are going to be your take on the kind of adaptation and the resilience building interventions and more looking at the holistic approach? Because you know, there are a lot of piecemeal approaches, but what we need is a more holistic approach. So what do you think is that kind of holistic approach which you think which can be really taken forward? Because there are a lot of ongoing efforts of the government CSOs, but they are still kind of in a scattered <coughs> way. So over to you with the more holistic approach. Thank you. Uh, I, I mean, I don't have the exact answer, but I'll probably give some examples and some thoughts around this um, because holistic approach, uh, in the region as complex as the Hindu Kush Himalayas might be difficult to define by, you know, by a group that's sitting further away as already elucidated by speakers before me. We need, we need conversations happening across bridges. We need spaces which, brokered spaces, facilitated spaces where these conversations happen. Um, we also need, um, need uh, thinking through of how we are measuring, how we are monitoring uh, complex concepts like resilience. Um, I will preface this by saying that for GRP, um, resilience is the ability to navigate change. So it, it's, a, it's, it's a very broad concept, but it's also fairly, it allows for flexibility, it allows for adaptive learning, it allows for inclusivity and equity, which is a core attribute, uh, but it also builds in redundancy and diversity in the systems that we work in. And, and uh, Hindu Kush Himalayas being one of the regions where we've recently uh, begun working in, uh, we, we approach this in a few different ways. We work through a challenge-led approach to innovation. So here we are, we believe that there's no straitjacket, one solution. There are multiple solutions that multiple groups are actually working on. Communities may have a very strong lived experience which might, uh, which might add a great complementarity to the data that exists and, and as is evidenced by everything that was said before me. Um, and, and all of this requires an approach where we don't enter uh, the region with, uh, with an already preformed idea of what the solutions are. People are already adapting, people are already resilient. The cost of resilience probably is that the systems don't <coughs> enable them. And, and what we are trying to do is create that, that, that enabling environment around, um, around, uh, around their local adaptation. Uh, so that's one. The second aspect of bridging these gaps between data and uh, data and community experiences, faith, lived lived experiences, uh, is something that we have been it, we've been really passionate about in in our uh, learning approaches, transdisciplinary learning approaches, and we bring in a lot of arts-based approaches to our uh, to our learning spaces where we uh, where we have been engaging with uh, uh, youth group in uh, Nepal called Youth Innovation Lab who've built a who've basically created a mural through uh, through public inputs uh, and flood modeling so it's data deficient regions where uh, flood modeling may be fairly high resolution where uh, these communities came in with um, with with the exact examples of the flood was here until until uh, in in the last year or here when I was uh, this age, etc. So that that kind of gave an idea of of uh, what was the impact on the community and how how they can respond to it. So uh, yeah, we have been we have been bridging these these gaps through small initiatives uh, and uh, yeah, and finally bringing them all together through learning events uh, like the resilience evidence for that we had last year uh, where we co-hosted this with uh, USAID. And um, yeah, we, we basically uh, articulated the need for uh, communities to be users and producers of the resilience evidence that we are creating here uh, as experts. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. So now I come back to you, Arun. No. And uh, this is regarding that glacier preservation. And I know that EC Mood and you have been pretty much engaged with that. So we would like you to share with us some notable examples of glacier preservation initiatives or the efforts which have been undertaken and how if much you feel they were effective so in mitigating this kind of a glacier impact. So over right. to you. Thank you. Um, as I indicated in the opening, uh, I take this term glacier preservation as, as more symbolic uh, and talk about more, you know, uh, addressing the impacts those uh, glacier chains uh, are likely to have. Now, I would not say I have a lot of exposure about uh, glacier preservation. Um, so we know about uh, uh, efforts in Alps, about you know trying to cover glacier with geotextile, for example, uh, you know white color geotextile, so that the albedo uh, <coughs> can actually help uh, uh, limit the melting. Uh, and in Rhone Glacier, maybe I have not seen it myself. I have read about it. I have heard people talk about it, and in Austria. But uh, what I know is that it, it is quite limited effort. Uh, you know, small area of glacier, let alone uh, the whole glacier, maybe also not uh, the ablation area. Closer to home in Hindukush Himalaya, uh, there are efforts going on, for example, building what is called artificial glacier, um, and also uh, ice tupas. Uh, these are efforts being made in, in Ladakh. And I have, uh, I have seen those uh, things. I have met uh, the designer, um, like uh, Norfel Chewang, uh, who has been uh, spending his life uh, around uh, artificial glacier and Sonamuansuk for uh, the ice tupas. And then recently I met, uh, you know, last week, well, uh, uh, I met people in Gilgit, Baltistan, Pakistan, which, who independently uh, actually started ice tupa again. Okay. Uh, and you know, uh, importance of water in those areas, very ar arid area is very important. Um, and then, you know, this whole year of glacier preservation is dedicated to this. But my understanding is, again, these are more symbolic efforts. The actual, you know, impact is quite limited by scale, by, you know, resources needed and technologies. So my uh, take on this is while we talk about it, and try to raise awareness about importance of glacier, we have to talk about adapting to what happens because of changing glaciers, right? Uh, water resource management for too much and too little water is something which we really need to focus on. So I think you have given me an indication of time up, so I will, I will, I will stop yeah. here. Thank you. Th thank you. Maybe if there are audience questions, then you can talk. Sure. Oh. And uh, so I know that good that you talked about the uh, stupas also. So that's one of the good practice. And Suchi, over to coming to you, uh, you know, like uh, as we know and others have been talking about that without interdisciplinary and interinstitutional efforts, I don't think anything is going to be possible in this kind of a task. So given that, so can you share any example or your suggestions which can be considered as potential policy proposition in this direction? Because we would like to have in this three minutes round some policy implications. That's an interesting question. And uh, I'll probably frame it as uh, we uh, at GRP, we look at policy as broader than the government negotiations that happen around climate change or frameworks that are prepared, but also consolidating non-state actor voices in um, in global, regional, and local fora. So um, we have been engaging uh, at the South Asia level, uh, South Asia, Africa, and Latin America levels, actually, but South Asia is most relevant. We have been engaging uh, with multiple organizations, including a lot of those who are present in the room, um, on, uh, on consolidating voices of what are the climate 
priorities around uh, water in the region. So uh, this is critical because a lot of our voices uh, remain disparate in, in uh, global negotiations. So this is critical to kind of bring these voices to the fore and amplify them at, at global scale. So this is, uh, this is something that's core uh, to our work. Secondly, uh, something that is really important, probably overlooked, is the private sector involvement in this space. Uh, and we need more investment uh, in adaptation and resilience. That's a given. Uh, but we, are, we have probably never brought in, we, there's deep distrust, and we have probably never brought in the private sector into these rooms where we are discussing adaptation and resilience. We are trying to build those bridges with the private sector. We, our core values remain around local uh, adaptation, locally led adaptation, community experiences, and strengthening that with data and evidence. Uh, but we also want to bridge that gap with uh, with private sector and their commitments to resilience we've been uh, we're implementation partners to uh, the US uh, Department of State uh, prepare call to action uh, which which is bringing in private sector contribution to resilience and adaptation uh, so those I think those two key things one um, one regional voices at at global and uh, local dialogues and secondly um, private sector inclusion in uh, uh, conversations that we have around adaptation, especially locally led adaptation, as enabling voices in, in that space is, uh, I think, two propositions that I'd make. Thank you very much, Suchi. So uh, I come to Austin, and uh, you know that uh, data information uh, has been really very important and has also been a kind of a challenging issue as well. So how can data sharing and also the downscale climate projections uh, can help in better understanding the upstream downstream linkages and particularly addressing the developmental impacts on the downstream areas. So can you suggest a way forward? I know it's very difficult to ask for you because it's really, so your take on that because, so what are your future suggestions? If you were sitting on that highest seat, how would you move? <laughs> Well, the question has evolved a bit since last <laughs> I saw it, but um, <laughs> I'll start by saying, you know, we have to work on two fronts. We have to work on structure and process, right? And they're equally important. Um, from the data perspective, information infrastructures are critical. Uh, data governance issues being included, geopolitical sensitivities regarding data sharing being what they are. Nonetheless, there's a need to push and evolve information infrastructures at the national scale to be more open. Uh, when, there, when possible, the, when there are regional data sharing efforts, or there, I'll actually come, I'm glad uh, um, Arun mentioned the Botikoshi flood. There's, when there's an event like, a transboundary event like the GLOF that happened in 2016 that impacted the Botikoshi hydropower project, in the wake of that event, uh, and a little bit preceding, but more so in the wake, there was actually a sort of an informal data sharing effort going on in that basin, where upstream authorities uh, in the China side were in conversation with authorities on the Nepal side, in particular the hydropower developers, to share flow data and other alerts, simple alerts when future conditions changed. At least that's what we've heard in the area. That type of thing, while it's not uh, always replicable and it depends on specific personalities, it's an opening. Um, so perhaps there are other events when we think about transboundary risks, perhaps sec environmental security concerns across boundaries, we can find openings like that. Um, and that helps us shape structure and, and overall and, and thinking about so quickly, I've done a lot of work on hydropower uh, over the years. Um, I created a map in 2014. It was meant to just show uh, all the hydropower products in Nepal on a, on, a, on a given map and then try to make it interactive, w working with Kathmandu Living Labs uh, and a couple of other organizations at the time. Um, that type of work, I think, can actually push our conversations about infrastructure development to think about upstream, downstream planning and sensitivities. Hope more of that work is done in the future. Um, but to come back, you know, the system, we have to think not just what the system looks like, but what counts as data, when and how and why, whose data counts, and who gets to input and who gets to be someone who helps manage data. Um, and as we bring more voices to the table, we, adaptive management is more possible. Um, the process of, uh, for example, in early warning systems, the process of creating uh, alerts or sharing them, uh, the process of sharing, of creating a situation where data is shared, information flows, in both directions in a two-way dialogue is often just as valuable as the, the alert itself, right? So investing in a process where data is a conversation is critical, and that's important for the regions also that 
um, Fasang and Suchi both mentioned, right, we're talking about communities that are living with increased risks. This is a procedural justice question, right, to make sure <coughs> that they're involved. And we don't just want to always talk about their vulnerability. We want to talk about agency first uh, and what data that they have and what knowledge and expertise they have and bring. So. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, so the last question on this round to Pasang, and uh, you know that all these things which we have been talking about, now what kind of practices and uh, policy solutions would you recommend for more inclusive approach to addressing water security challenges in the Himalayan region, mm -hmm. looking into all these kind of uh, challenges? and the community involvement. Mm -hmm. um, I think we need to rethink uh, what we mean by inclusive approach. Um, I think that's where I would start. Uh, just by bringing everyone to the table is not going to solve the problem. Uh, we need to recognize that each uh, member we include and invite uh, to the table have different things to contribute. Um, so for example, uh, you know, like 15 years ago, we already knew there were several critical glacial lakes in the region based on the research that Dr. Shrestha was involved in. And, um, but at that time, uh, what, we also, um, what we also knew was that the region is also a sacred space for us. It is our ancestral home. And there are a lot of long ties to the land, to the uh, beings that we see and we don't see. Um, and so there are different kinds of questions, different kinds of needs uh, that each uh, person on the table will be bringing. So I think it's very important to recognize that. But from a policy uh, uh, angle, I, I do think, um, and some of the, one of the things that has not, uh, I think, uh, received enough attention is um, there have been enough uh, systematic review of uh, literature, scientific literature that are produced globally. And what we have consistently found is that uh, in the South Asia Himalayan region, the community participation and the way community is engaged with is one of the most, um, non-collaborative, uh, I would say, um, instead of harmful. But uh, one of the most non-collaborative uh, examples uh, is found in the South Asia, um, uh, and I'm thinking, I'm talking about this, like the overall approach uh, that the systematic reviews have concluded. But that being said, uh, there has been consistent push, and for a very long time, the researchers from the region have been talking about and have really pushed for community engagement and community involvement. But how do we actually do that? I think that's where the challenge lies. Um, and so in that case, I think that question of inclusion makes a lot of sense uh, by recognizing what needs and what aspirations and what questions people are bringing to the table, I think is important to consider, um, and what strengths um, people are bringing to the table, those things are important to consider. Thank you, thank you very much. I think let's give them a big hand to all the four panelists <laughs> and for, for, for being so candid in your responses. And now uh, we open the floor for discussion. We have another about 18 to 20 minutes to go. We will have the audience who is here in person and also there are questions coming on the chat in a virtual mode. So I think maybe first I can, oh yes, yes Franz, please. Okay. Okay. Um, Thank you, all of you, for the amazing insight some on this uh, critical issue. Um, Franz Matzner, I'm representing the International Campaign for Tibet Advertisement. We have a panel coming up on Wednesday at 11 o'clock on the similar topic, so come on. Um, but the, the question I have is we're all talking about holistic approaches and inclusion. It's more and more an important topic. Uh, justice is a word that's put out there a lot. Um, but my question to everybody on the panel, whoever wants to take it, is when we talk about that, as you're saying about the, you know, the spiritual involvement, there's also the big boogeyman in the room that's not addressed, which is human rights violations. So I'm curious of how all of you would take that into account from whether we're talking about who's at the table and who's making the decisions and whether that needs to be directly challenged by the entities who are also there that are maybe non-governmental. Thank you very much. 
So it's not to any particular panelist. It's a it's a general thing. So maybe we let's have one or two more, and then we'll come back if anybody. Any sure, thank you. And thank you very much for the uh, very interesting, interesting session, and thank you to pal panelists. My name's Lance Gorham with the Asian Development Bank. Um, I would, we're working quite actively now in Nepal, Bhutan, and other Hindu Kush and Miller countries now trying to help the countries with getting up front of some of these challenges that you've been talking about today. My question to you would be to what advice would you be giving us as a multilateral development bank? Um, where do you think that we should be uh, having those conversations with our member countries and the communities in those countries? Um, sometimes uh, I hear there's a, a, a lack of data, a lack of science, um, so there could be more money and effort spent in there. As you've said, lack of coordination possibly, um, bringing in communi community-led approaches. Um, Ma'am, you've mentioned lack of private sector involvement. I'd be interested to learn more where you think the private sector has a, a role to play here. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mavi. I think uh, these two questions are open to you. Who, who wants to go? I can go. I can go. Take the second <laughs> one. Um, so I'll just go ahead and address... Uh, the two questions. Um, I think coming to your question, that's the question that I think about a lot uh, because I use the word very intentionally, indigenous, um, to mean people of the land and people from there. And uh, this is also, without a doubt, a political term, uh, which many Asian countries do not recognize. Um, so for me, the way I think, and this is where I'm going more like professorial, where, you know, uh, I think the solution comes from the people, which is being creative. And when I'm saying people, I'm not just talking about it, indigenous communities, but people involved in various international campaigns like yourself. Like we have been doing this for a long time in very creative ways. And sometimes uh, it's important to look at the issue from a nation state perspective. Other times it's important to look, change the perspective and the lens to people-centered and people perspective. And uh, I think to not forget that people have been doing this for a long time in very creative ways, and to highlight that would be the first step to do it. Um, and um, uh, coming back to your question, I think, uh, so one of the things I was thinking about this morning as I was preparing for the panel was um, how indigenous communities are not just uh, for a long time, I used to say indigenous communities have been observing and experiencing climate change effects, but I realized suddenly that not only were we observing, have, been, have we been observing and experiencing climate change impact, we have also been recognizing and uh, observing and um, uh, analyzing um, how scientists have been engaging with climate change effect in the region and also what, kind of, what kinds of infrastructure investment is needed. Um, and so sometimes I think uh, we uh, make the false assumption that the communities, when we say indigenous communities, they are against development. But a lot of those communities need development for survival, including the hydropower that you so rightly mentioned. And so a lot of this infrastructure, not only the hydropower, with the latest Thami uh, incident, uh, we know that the road that, was, that took years and years of lobbying and work uh, to build have been destroyed and bridges downstream have been destroyed. And so how do we then think about, coming back to what you were saying, how do we um, uh, rethink, flex I think the term you used was flexibility, mm -hmm. and how do you make it flexible, but also recognize uh, that indigenous communities and community involvement is very important to understand where and what kinds of infrastructure needs to be built. And I say that with the full uh, awareness that even before remote sensing and the scientists were paying attention to the lake one, two, three, four, five above Thami, um, after the incident, the community already knew there were several glacial lakes. And the community already knew the uh, one of the glacial lakes that um, flooded has um, is relatively new. Uh, and so um, 
so I think the way we even think about the community and community engagement, involvement, and participation has to be more evolved um, and has to recognize that they have more to share as experts. Um, yeah. Uh, maybe answering to your question, uh, uh, I'm aware of this uh, new initiative, the Building Adaptation and Resilience in Hindu Kush Himalaya, starting with Nepal and uh, Bhutan. Um, and we are involved with it quite a lot. And our work uh, related to climate resilient hydropower actually contributes uh, very much to what you are trying to do. So uh, I think the advice probably is to do what I kind of put in four points. One is having a holistic uh, basin perspective uh, with development, ecosystem, and, and community uh, in, in the picture and acknowledging the nexus. Uh, the second is you know, having the data sharing arrangement across border and ADB probably can uh, kind of uh, catalyze this process and if we join together it might be useful. Um, um, so trying to emphasize more on those aspects and not invest without making sure those aspects are being addressed uh, that's one. And then the second point I would like to make is that, you know, this South Asia or Hindu Kush Himalaya is quite uh, sensitive, geopolitically sensitive. The trust is quite at low level. And the level of cooperation according to, you know, uh, David Gray's continuum of cooperation probably is in the lower most, uh, you know, con uh, side. So we have quite a lot to do. But what we cannot do is provoke it. You know, if we start provocating any, any party, I think we will fail before the show begins. So I think diplomacy is what we need. Trust building is what we need. And I repeat, this is a long march. We cannot do it in one or two steps. Thank you. Uh, All right. Can I? Can I come in and answer that question uh, on private sector especially? Uh, so a couple of things. Uh, we're also uh, we're aware of the initiative uh, that ADB is involved in. Uh, we're also partnering with EC Mode on the innovation challenge that I mentioned earlier. Uh, what we are doing is we are flipping the narrative around solutions a little bit. Uh, we're not going in with, with an assumption that we know what local innovation is or local solutions are. And what we are doing is we are understanding where the innovation potential lies in the region. Uh, there's plenty that's happening already. There's plenty of local investments, local uh, uh, funds, startups, also nonprofits working in very f innovative ways around uh, around resilience and adaptation. Uh, and uh, we would first like to start out with surfacing all of that. Uh, so we are starting out hopefully next year, we're launching the challenge with uh, the DDG uh, IC mode at New York Climate Week. Uh, and then um, we, we will basically uh, surface small innovations, help them with enabling support, uh, so that they achieve scale not just at the level of uh, more money, which is important, uh, pipeline funding, which is important, but also in terms of how deep their scale is and how wide their scale is in terms of their reach, in terms of their depth of work that they're doing in their regions. So very place-based approach to uh, whatever innovations are happening. So right now, we don't know what the solutions are. We know what the problems are. Uh, we know there's, there's need for uh, support in agriculture, in markets, in value chain in linkages, uh, there's support needed for water and spring shed management as was raised. There's need for disaster risk management uh, in, in innovative ways uh, potentially. Uh, but all of this and, and through technology and markets, uh, local markets, when I say markets, it's not necessarily markets in general, but also local markets. So all of this is, is uh, our, our broad assumptions or rather broad uh, understanding that we have based on the scoping that we've done in the region, but we don't know what the solutions are. So we are we we hope that we'll, we'll, uh, we'll be able to, in the long run, be able to uh, create some sort of an investment structure which will, with, of course, the help of everybody in the room, it's not just GRP, GRP is a partnership. So um, ADB definitely, EC Mode, uh, others who are working in the region, USAID, US State, um, 
ensuring that uh, there is long-term sustained investment in local solutions and local innovation. So that's that's where we are at, and that's where I mean it would be great if we can have a conversation uh, separately as well on that. Uh, secondly, I think on the private sector, I think there's immense potential with private sector in the region because these are valuable supply chains, not just for uh, not just for uh, the. Uh, the niche products, but also highly commercial global commodities that are needed. So uh, the private sector definitely has uh, interest from that perspective, but communities have historically earned very low returns on these uh, on on these niche products that they have been selling. Uh, processing happens elsewhere, and so uh, the way the way uh, we do need private sector engagement in the region is to flip the narrative around where processing happens, who gets, uh, how do the markets function for the collective good of the region uh, is where we definitely need more conversations on. And I think, again, I go back to uh, Dr. Sheshta's point around um, trust building. We also need trust building there. We also need um, facilitation and diplomacy with the private sector, and we really need them on board, uh, is what I learned at. Thank you. Thank you. Austin, I'll be you very brief. Something? Yeah, I'll be very brief just so we can have more time for uh, more questions. Um, but quickly to, to the first question, to go back, um, given geopolitical sensitivities, you need a broader ecosystem of actors who are creating data. You need to have data coming from different directions. You need to have uh, a more diverse ecosystem. Um, the ways we shape information infrastructure shape the ways evidence is presented, sh shapes the way that narratives are constructed, and that shapes policy. So thinking about creating new tools for ethical and ethical standards for data collection, perhaps in that recognize some of these uh, human rights issues and justice questions is critical. But like Arun said, this is a challenging terrain. Um, uh, to the question from, uh, from Lars from ADB, uh, our project with Simpson began with a, a third, sort of a scoping study based on the Melamchi disaster of 2021. Um, we did that study in 2022 and it shaped the design of our overall system. I think ADB is a great example of a leading actor that's had sort of a, a wake up call in a way and has responded very productively. Um, not just the project that's now underway, which we're also tracking closely, um, but also there was a, a report that was released by ADB by Hans Engrab and others, and it had a really valuable small section in there called Rethinking the Design Flood, which is sort of a technical section, but that kind of exercise as a leading example and, and propagating across other parts of the region, watershed by watershed, taking really specific multi-hazard regimes into, a, into consideration, I think is the way forward. Um, but we also have to acknowledge that there are risks that are not yet identified. In Melamchi, you had the Bremetang debris deposit, in other watersheds, you may have other problems that you don't, net, you don't yet know what to look for. So this comes back to the comments I made earlier on uncertainty and trying to identify ways of uh, navigating the unknown. But one thing also, and maybe this connects these two questions, uh, surprise, I don't think we've talked too much about loss and damage yet, but the ways we, we account for loss and damage, try to make it a more inclusive process, try to make it a more equitable process is critical. Um, perhaps ADB and others can invest in a, a process that uh, recognizes ongoing attempts to do so at the ground level. People have a very good idea of what the impacts might be and knowledge sharing impact and knowledge sharing uh, events as well. Um, but loss and damage, I think, is a critical connecting point between these two questions. All right, thank you. Anyone else in the audience? Yes, of course. Yeah, I think you and then first. over there. Okay. And then Hi, all. I'm Sonu Khanal, Glacier Hydrologist at Future Water Netherlands. And first, thank you for all the insightful discussion. And uh, I think we discussed a lot about Thame floods, Chamoli, Botekoshi, and Gloff threats, right? So my question to the panel is, so what is the way forward in bringing national and regional stakeholders in the context of transboundary cooperation, right? And uh, how they can help in water and climate adaptation and resi resilience in Hindukush Himalaya, but in the broader context of high mountain Asia. There's also, there are also two here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I'm Giriraj from International Water Management Institute. I think uh, this is being a first uh, Stockholm Water Week. Uh, it reiterated this side event in a very strong way of uh, the challenges and the opportunities you reiterated. Um, I, I just want to see one particular uh, uh, message from the panelist here. We have seen various intervention. You described uh, uh, quite a lot of 
problems and solutions as well. Uh, from my own experience, if you see that, we how are we really building the resilience there? Uh, most of the projects, if you see, there is no transition to sustainability. The project comes in a frame and it exits and the community do know that there is no return of investments in the same household level. So how do we make solutions that would be long term, which is low cost, viable and persistent and looking at a long term impact? Because we, we keep moving to locations to location and investments are also moving, go and go. So if from your point of view, what would be the three things that you would like to do addressing this particular problem? All right, so that's the last one. And then I think any one of you can take it very quick. Because we don't maybe let's time. take a few extra questions and then we can All respond. Right. If we take a few extra May questions, and yeah, as no, many no, as we no. can. Uh, very, very quick ones. I'm uh, Takahiro Konami from the government of Japan, the factory. I would like to uh, appreciate this initiative to, to uh, make a good uh, solution. So Japan is also uh, contributing to this area through the Asia Pacific for Water Forum. And my question is very quick ones. So uh, I'd like to highlight that the ground data observatory is very important to uh, for accurate uh, data. So how is the situation of the ground truth data, observatory data in this area? Uh, thank you. May I suggest that we also be gender inclusive and include two questions from the women in the group? <laughs> Over there. It's coming. Gender inclusive. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Hi, I'm Electra Pellanda. I'm uh, I represent Challenge Works. Um, uh, we are an, an open innovation um, consultancy. Uh, I have a question for Mrs. Vora, but I guess everyone can uh, can uh, respond if you like. Um, do you have any examples of nature-based solutions uh, that could come in handy with uh, helping with the impact and the the adaptation work that needs to happen with glacier melting? And uh, could this be community-led? No man, no man. This is the last one. And thanks, thanks. Uh, Brian Eiler from the Stimson Center. Uh, Austin and I worked together on our 4C Nepal early warning project. Um, just a question for any of you about remote sensing and Earth observation. How do you make a connection between, say, the satellites and communities uh, and, 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 and better uh, kind of make better use of this new disruptive technology to meet community needs? Thanks. Can we take one last question from the oh. other female? <laughs> yeah. Um, hi, thank you very much. Uh, my name's Zoe. Uh, I work for the Center for Hydrology with the University of Saskatchewan in Western Canada. Uh, and a couple of you mentioned some of the bigger initiatives that are going on, uh, like the UN Year of uh, Glacier Preservation. I think that was Aaron, if I'm saying that correctly. And I was just wondering if you see opportunities in this sort of big picture global agenda setting approach to make concrete advances, at least locally, in data or monitoring or early warning systems, policy, et cetera. Uh, or at least what would you want to see um, from these sort of global uh, initiatives to make uh, concrete changes happen? Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much. I think there are no other questions, so maybe uh, any one of you can take any one or two questions, otherwise we'll make a note of it and you can respond in writing also later on. I'll just address the nature-based solution part. I think it's the, I, I'll come back to the community for on, uh, on this one because the community, uh, the Sherpas, for example, you know, have always been able to adapt and always be resilient to the so many glaciers, uh, uh, so many gloves that have happened in our living history. Um, but what uh, changes today is the frequency, the rate, and the way in which these gloves are occurring. It's not giving us enough time to actually adapt. It's not giving us enough time to be prepared for it. And that's what is scary, and that's what's, at, um, what's um, challenging at this time. Um, so uh, with that, I'll just um, stop. All right, so thank you. Oh, you okay. Um, Last one, okay. Uh, four things I would like to say. One, we really need a mechanism, working mechanism. The region lacks a working mechanism that can bring all stakeholders together. 
we have been talking about lack of data. When I started my career, we talked about lack of data. <laughs> I'm retiring soon, we still talk about it. So I think we, I mean, we can do a lot with what we have. Nature-based solution, I think that's something which we really need to work on. What is nature-based solution? Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of frameworks. Everybody wants to develop their own work, uh, uh, work, uh, framework. So that's something which we really need to look at. And of course, community has to be part of it. Without community involvement, I think that cannot be a nature-based solution. I'll stop here. All right, so I have five, wor five words. Uh, 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 Invest, actually it's only four, invest in sustained ground truthing. So to connect some of the questions about sustainability and ground truthing, the process needs to be invested for the long term, not just validating at one point. I guess that's more than five words. All right, thank you. And there are many questions. You guys can always send your response in writing and we'll make a note. Uh, any last much, word? Mine is a much longer answer. Maybe Giriraj we can meet separately and chat about that. All right, so that solves problem. So thank you very much for, let's give them a big hand. And uh, so now with this, we come to the last uh, uh, closing remarks from my colleague, uh, Dr. Jonathan, who is a research group leader for integrated management of basins and aquifers in EMI in South Africa. So over to you. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Alok. And uh, thanks to all the panelists and all the, the organizers. Um, it's quite a challenging position I've been put in here to summarize what was a really exciting discussion in just two or three minutes, I'm told. Um, but basically, very interesting. I think to, to recap in very brief, the early presentations really gave us a sense of the severity of the challenge. Um, these retreating glaciers in Central Asia, I think when Alok presented, he highlighted that this is a not a uniform challenge. So there's actually diversity across the Himalayas. We heard about some, some technological advances that are helping uh, with monitoring, survey and mod flow to, to, to respond to that. And then we moved into a p uh, panel session. We heard a really good set of interesting points um, from the different panelists. Arun, I think you had some great points around um, the need for integrated river basin management. Um, you know, including uh, the nexus, to, uh, de including economic development, ecosystems, and, and livelihoods, uh, communities, really important. Um, and then I think from, uh, we heard about community, uh, sorry, co community resilience and, and inclusivity also um, from Prasang, that was quite good. Um, Suchi brought out some small scale angles, um, the, the need for private sector involvement, regional voices, also very good, and Austin, um, really excellent points around uh, flood early warning system and the need to enhance monitoring and governance frameworks uh, as well. If I'm to kind of pull out, say, two key messages here um, in the last 30 seconds or so of this sum up, um, it's just to remind us that co cooperation is elusive. When we talk about the severity of the challenges on two levels, uh, it's on the biophysical level, but it's also on the governance level. And in, that, in the context of this governance, this, this, this cooperative uh, advancement has is, is been a, an area of challenge. Um, I really liked Arun's point. I think I nodded my head when he said we have to start somewhere. Baby steps, low-hanging fruit. Um, pick up on what's working. I think um, there was a nice point from uh, Austin around an example of informal data exchange, but uh, I think in 2016, it'd be nice to kind of capture these and look for ways to build on them. We're not gonna conquer the world in, in a day. Um, and I think we heard repeatedly this is a long process. So really, um, we've gotta start somewhere with this low hanging fruit baby steps and, and then build on those. A uh, second key point, I think, and this is building off a point, I think Suchi mentioned at some point, is keep the dialogue going. This is a long process. Um, cooperation is a long haul, getting it going is a long haul, um, and I think there was a reference to particular challenges in the global context in this region. Um, so in that context, I want to say this, this is a good example of the dialogue. Hopefully we build on this um, going forward next year and then beyond, and this is an example of using science to feed into dialogue that helps us respond to a regional challenge. So I want to thank everybody for coming um, and hope you enjoy the next sessions at World Water Week. Thanks again. Looking forward to continuing the discussion on the sidelines. <laughs>